Thank God for His grace this morning. Amen. If it were not for His grace, we would all be lost. It's by His grace we are saved. We're saved by grace through faith. And so we, we look to the Lord for salvation, for His direction in the service this morning. Let's turn to John chapter 3 passage of scripture that most of us are familiar with. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, <coughs> Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. <clears throat> Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, <clears throat> How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you of earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses was lifted up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, we look to you this morning, asking you to just open up your word to our minds and hearts. May we be convicted of the Holy Spirit of this truth. May it not just be something that we know intellectually and receive with our heads, but may it be something we receive into our hearts and fully embrace this spiritual truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we want <clears throat> to talk about being born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. <coughs> You must be born again. A lot of people assume that they're saved. A lot of people have uh, followed a certain formula that people tell them to say. And then they accept the word of the person who's instructing them that now you are saved. Well, being born again is a matter of coming into spiritual contact with God. It's more than just going through a formula. It's knowing in our hearts that we are saved. We're born again. As I say, many <clears throat> assume that they're saved who really aren't saved. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many <clears throat> mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of lawlessness. So it's obvious from Jesus, what Jesus said that many on the day of judgment will be assuming they're saved when Jesus will say, I never knew you. 
So that behooves us, this behooves us this morning to consider whether we really are born again or whether we've just assumed that we're saved and born again. You know, Nicodemus came to Jesus as a Pharisee, a very educated religious leader, a man that knew all 613 points of the <clears throat> Torah, of the first five books of the Bible. He, he was a man who knew the law. He was a man who understood the traditional teaching. But when Jesus said to him, you must be born again, he was startled. You know, Nicodemus came and, and uh, he said to Jesus, we, we know you are a teacher come from God because no one can do these miracles that you've been doing except God be with him. And Jesus could have gone on and done a lot of small talk with him, but Jesus cut right to the quick. He got right to the point. He said, unless you are born of God, you cannot see the kingdom or born of the Spirit, born again, rather. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So we must be born again. Nicodemus said, well, how can these things be? Can a man enter again into his mother's womb and be born? Can a woman, we could say, can she enter into her mother's womb and be born? So Jesus went on to say, well, you know, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Nicodemus, you need to understand the difference. You've been born into this world through your mother's womb. You can't be born again by going back into her womb. You need to be born of the spirit. You need to be born of God. You need to come alive spiritually. And then Jesus went on to say, you know, the wind blows and you don't know where it's coming and where it's going, but you know it's there. Without looking at a weather map, we don't know where the wind's coming or where it's going. But when we hear it, we know it's there and we believe it. We accept it. Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, it can't be explained just how all this happens, but you will know when it happens. You'll have the wind of the Spirit and you'll, you'll sense it. You'll know that you have it when you're born again. This is a, a spiritual matter. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So <clears throat> while it's, it's very helpful to understand uh, that we are sinners uh, and that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, in fact, it's necessary for us to um, uh, believe in this in order to be saved. But just making a mental assent to those facts and then declaring I'm saved, all in the human does not save us. We must be convicted of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in the world to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit is here this morning to convict us. And uh, after a while, we're going to give you an opportunity to come and kneel and get right with God if you are not born again this morning. Because we all must be born again. But this is a matter of coming into spiritual contact with God. The Holy Spirit convicts us, and then He leads us to pray. You know, the old timers talked about praying through. <laughs> Those of you who've been around for a while, you know what they meant by praying through. They meant that you need to pray, talk to God until you're aware that He truly does forgive you. Now you don't just go on praying a long prayer and pray and pray and pray without exercising faith. We need to exercise faith. But as we pray and talk to God and just pour our hearts out to God and tell Him we've done wrong and ask Him to forgive us and we seek God, then He is faithful to bring us to that point where we know and we can confess with our mouth that we're saved. We can know. We can know. But realizing that this is a matter of not just physical life and death, but the ma a matter of spiritual life and spiritual death, realizing that this makes all the difference of whether we go to heaven or not, makes all the difference of whether we go to hell or not. 
We need to be sure we're born again. It's not just going through a little formula that somebody lays out and then ask us <clears throat> to follow through and then tells us we're saved. No one can tell you when you're saved. I never tell someone, well, now you've prayed, now you're saved. I was actually in a, in a holiness church one Sunday morning and people came forward to be sanctified and, and uh, the preacher of all things, uh, when they went back to their seats, he said, now I felt God sanctify you, so you believe it. Uh, I should have confronted that preacher, you know. He's not the one to tell them whether they're sanctified. God, no person can tell us when we're saved. We, we appreciate the instruction, but we must know between us and God whether we're saved. Only you can know between you and the Lord whether you are born again. We're not born of our own will. We're born of the will of God. John 1, 11 to 13. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Born of the will of God. Yes, we, we receive him, but he must also receive us. We must know that he has received us. For it's by his will we are saved. It's by his choosing we are saved. We're born of the will of God. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> we are saved through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that anyone, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're saved by faith. We're saved to produce good works. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. Or, or by grace through faith. We're saved by grace through faith. God's grace uh, is bestowed on us. And we receive it by faith. We trust him. So salvation is not a matter of works. Now, um, I may have told you that my grandpa was raised in the Amish church. And the Amish church taught that... Uh, you couldn't really know for sure if you were going to heaven. You just had to hope your good deeds outweighed your bad deeds. Well, that was all salvation of works. And uh, my grandpa and uh, his dad, my great-grandpa and my grandpa's brother, all were attending a free Methodist camp meeting, uh, actually a tent meeting. They started to hear the gospel and the Lord touched their hearts. You know, he convicted them. He showed them their need. It was a spiritual matter. It wasn't just a matter of them accepting certain intellectual thoughts. They were convicted. They, they came to the Lord and, and got saved. Well, my grandpa uh, was, was praying for her to be saved. And uh, as I've heard the story, uh, one morning he, you know, he was a young man then. And he... Uh, He's going out to the field, he's a farmer, he's going out to work in his field, his cornfield, and he told his wife, uh, my grandmother, he said, uh, I just feel like I've gone too far, God's not gonna save me. But he kept praying, <laughs> and uh, he, he, he went out in the cornfield and kept praying, and finally he came to that place where his faith took hold, he knew he was saved, he started jumping up and down in the muddy cornfield, and he ran home and uh, told, <clears throat> Uh, his wife, he said, I got saved. And she looked him all over from head to toe and said, it looks like something happened to you. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about being saved. Now, you know, <clears throat> uh, we can't just say it's any certain formula by where we uh, are saved. Uh, 
There was a man walking through the alley in Chicago. A man that hadn't attended church maybe at all or very little for any, and he didn't know any, he didn't know hardly anything about God and relationship with God. But he was he was overcome with grief and depression and he 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 slid down he backed up against the wall as I understand it uh, there and slid down to the ground and looked up to, into heaven he said oh God I'm a sinner and just like that God saved him. this man who had never been taught hardly anything knew he was saved well he didn't know what to call it but he was so filled with the joy of the Lord he wanted to do something <clears throat> so he went out and bought some cat food and started feeding the cats well his faith took hold. I'm talking about being born again. Later on, he went to a mission there in Chicago uh, where uh, a preacher was, was preaching who I later learned to know. And uh, he learned more about the, the word and knew what really happened to him. But you see, he was saved. He was born again. This was something that happened between him and the Lord. He knew in his heart that he was saved. He was born again even though he didn't know what to call it to begin with. But we're saved through faith. Now the Catholic religion, and I don't attack Catholic people by any means, but uh, we do need to correct uh, some false teaching. Catholic Church teaches that the Eucharist is the source and summit of Christian life. That's their exact words. It's the source and summit of Christian life. Well, the, the, the communion that we partake of, that reminds us of what Jesus did. But there's no power within that communion itself to save us. Our faith must be directed to Jesus, directly to Jesus, not through the Eucharist of Jesus or to the Eucharist, period. And then that... Uh, <clears throat> Yet in the Catholic's teaching does not fully save you. You still have to do mentors' works and penance. They help earn your salvation. They teach your, they teach your saved by faith and works. This is what Martin Luther rebelled against. You still have to do penance and you know works that have merit. You have to merit your salvation. But even that isn't enough. When you die, you have to go to purgatory, and there endure the torture of purgatory for who knows how long in order to finally be saved. Well, that's not salvation by faith. And it's certainly not salvation by, it's certainly not the free gift of salvation. Salvation is a free gift, Romans 5 to 15, 5, 15 to 16, but the free gift it is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, that's Adam's trespass, we all uh, <clears throat> inherit his uh, sinful tendencies because of Adam's sin. For if, by, for if many died through one man's transgression, much more have the, the grace of God and the free gift by the, that, by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. The free gift. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment followed for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following men many trespasses brought justification. Over and over verse mentioned. Salvation is a free gift. You can't earn it. Now we're saved unto good works. And if we are saved, we're going to be living for God. We're going to be doing His will. Jesus says, you know, those that don't do my will, they'll come to before me and I'll say, you never, I never knew you. So faith leads us to do good works, but those good works, even if you're winning people to Jesus and, and praying and all those things, uh, which you will do if, if you're a Christian, at least you'll be working to lead people to the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> those are all things we need to do, but those don't save us. Those don't earn salvation. We need to keep that very clear in our minds. 
We don't earn salvation by doing good works. We are saved because we believe in Jesus. You see, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Jesus told Nicodemus, the Son of Man must be lifted up. But he's talking about being born again. Nicodemus didn't know what he was talking about at that time, but he, he was later to find out. And evidently, Nicodemus did eventually uh, get born again because he was there to help bury Jesus after the crucifixion. But you see, Jesus died in our place. That's why it's a free gift. We all have sinned. We all deserve the punishment that God promised Adam and Eve for sinning. The soul that sins, it shall die. But God, not wanting us to be lost, sent his son into the world to die in our place. There is an old story of a, a schoolmaster that went to a country school many years ago, back when everything was different. And uh, this particular school was made up of boys, and these boys were ornery. They were so ornery that uh, every teacher that came would soon leave. The boys would run him off, make it so difficult that he'd, he'd soon leave. And so here came another schoolmaster, and uh, the boys thought, ha, huh, we'll see how long he lasts. But uh, this uh, teacher got up and he said, well, we're going to have rules. And, but he said, I'll let you make the rules. And so, wow, this is different. So they started making rules one after another. One was don't lie, don't steal, and so on. And they came up with uh, a certain number of rules. They wrote them on the board. And then the teacher said, well, now, uh, what's going to be the punishment? And like I say, this was back when things were a lot different. <laughs> the boys said, uh, the person that breaks the rules is going to take off his shirt and receive so many lashes with the belt. The teacher said, well, that's pretty severe. And I said, no, that's what it is. Okay. So they made the rules. They, they <clears throat> uh, decided what the punishment should be. So things went along fairly good for a while. Then one day it was found out that one boy's lunch had been stolen. Well, one rule was you can't steal. So they made a search and here they discovered that a little boy had stolen the lunch. So they brought him before to the front of the school and, and everyone realized this little boy stole because he was hungry, he didn't have enough. And uh, now everyone was feeling bad. The teacher said, well, you know, we have to meet at the punishment. And so he asked the little boy to take off his, I, I, I believe they said that the, the boy had to take off his coat and be whipped, not take off his shirt. But when the little boy took off his coat, here he had no shirt. Now everyone was really feeling bad. Oh my, how can we whip this little boy? when he stole only because he was very hungry. The teacher said, I'm sorry, but we have to follow the rules. We have to meet out the punishment. And about that time, a boy in the back, we'll call him Jim, Big Jim, and this was little Jim up front here that had stolen the lunch. Big Jim said, could I take little Jim's whipping for him? The teacher said, well, I guess it doesn't really say anything. The rules don't say anything about not allowing someone else to take the place. So Big Jim came forward, took off his coat, and the teacher laid it on. He didn't spare. He laid it on him with the whip. And uh, then little Jim reached up, put his arms around Big Jim. He said, Big Jim, you took my whip. Now that's what Jesus did. He took our whipping for us. He died in our place. That's why we need to believe in him. Amen. You see, he died in our place. We have sinned. We've all sinned. 
We need to be forgiven. We need to uh, have the free gift of salvation so that we do not have to go to hell as punishment for our sin. Jesus took our place so we can be saved, but we have to believe in him. We have to recognize that he did die on the cross for our sins and that if we believe in his atonement, believe in what he did for us and trust him, then he will save us. And that's being born again, you see. Putting our trust in Jesus. Nicodemus had to put his trust in what Jesus said. And at this, at the end of our reading here, he's still wondering, he's still studying, he's still thinking. But evidently, well, actually quite clearly, he, he came to a point later where he was born again. Because his work showed that he was born again. His work didn't save him, but his work showed that he was born again. So we must uh, come to the Lord and believe in him. <clears throat> in Romans 10, 6 to 10 we read, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who shall descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the grave. You see, um, that's already been done. Jesus has descended. He did die, went to the grave, and was raised again. So we don't have to, we don't have to believe that that's going to happen. We believe that it already has happened. The word is nigh you, in your mouth, in your heart, that is the word of faith we proclaim because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. As we come to that point where we believe, and we, confess, we must confess with our mouth. You know, we have to acknowledge it. I still like the idea when people find the Lord at the altar, they stand up and tell us what happened. I really think that's the way it should be. But we at least have to acknowledge it to someone. Jesus, save me. I'm born again. <laughs> the man in the alley, he acknowledged it to the cat. He went out and bought cat food and fed them. <laughs> Uh, but you know better than that. You know, uh, we, but we must confess. We must acknowledge. You see, this nails it down. We must be born again and we must confess. The, born, uh, the one who is born of God overcomes the world. 1 John 5, 4-5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So this faith takes us beyond just acknowledging we're saved to overcome the world. It gives us victory over sin. It gives us victory over all that's in the world that, that goes against God. Yes, if you have a need this morning, we're going to, before long, give you a chance to come to the altar and pray. Maybe we've attended church for a long time. Maybe we've assumed we're saved, but are we really saved? And I'm not about to try to ask someone to throw away their confidence. No, if we know we're saved, then we need to hold to that. And Satan will try to tell us we're not saved when, when we are. But on the other hand, we need to have the witness of the Spirit. We need to know that we are saved, that we are right with God. Romans 8, 14 to 17, <laughs> For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 
His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. This is how we know we're saved. We become spiritually aware. When you uh, see someone walking on the street and you shake hands with that person, uh, or you come to church and you shake hands and start to speak, you know, you're aware. No one can tell you you didn't see that person. Your eyes saw the person, your hand felt the handshake. No one can tell you, oh, that's just an illusion. You are aware through your senses. Well, we can be just as, just as aware through our spirit. Our spirit is our organ of communication with God. Our spirit <clears throat> contacts God's spirit. Actually, it would be better to say his spirit contacts our spirit as we seek him. And through the sense of the Spirit, if I may call it that, it's not really a sense, but just to get us to understand, through the awareness, through the sense of the Spirit, we know just as vividly as we know that we see someone else and that we shake hands with them or whatever. So this is not some guess so thing. This is something we can know about. We need to seek God. We need to call on him and ask him to give us the new birth so that we're born spiritually. So we're born into a spiritual understanding of his word. Then God's word becomes alive to us. We're alive spiritually. Until we are born again, we're, we're not alive. We're dead spiritually. But in being born again, we become alive in the Lord and then we, we have this spiritual relationship with Him. This communion that we've been talking about. The Lord created us in order that we might have communion with Him. We need to be born, but we need to be born again in order to have that communication. In order for our, our spirits to be awakened and sense God and know spiritually that we are saved. Let's turn to the song that uh, Mary and I sang on uh, page 213. Let's all stand and we'll sing this song. If there's anyone here who says, I need to be saved, I need to be sure I'm born again. And you'd like to come.